All right, we are recording again. And here we go. Okay, well, we'll start with a prayer for our second session today, the 29th of September. Uh, this will be our uh, founding generation in religion. We'll focus on John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. I'm very excited uh, to chat with you today about a number of things. Uh, and, and so why don't we start, uh, Caitlin, would you offer our prayer for us, please? Thank you so much. Dear Heavenly Father, we're very thankful that we're able to um, come united um, and able to learn about the your hand through this country and how we will be able to preserve it. And we ask a blessing that we will truly take in what is learned and to apply it to our lives. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I love that prayer. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm very grateful for this topic because once again, uh, it's certainly sad to hear um, that we have a class where the students are just going to look at, let's see how all the things that were wrong with the Puritans and just come up with a big, great big list. That makes me very sad. It also makes me incredibly sad when we see uh, a movement among textbook writers and those who are on different uh, public education history committees in our nation uh, who try very, very hard uh, to minimize or completely erase mention of religiosity and spirituality and our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ uh, in the history of this nation. Um, and that uh, is perhaps no more prevalent these days than when it comes to the Founding Fathers uh, and sort of a re-imaging, if you will, of motivation when it comes to why they did what they did. Please. And it's a perfect setup for um, changing the, all the documents because oh, exactly. if, if God is never taught and mm -hmm. we don't understand that foundation, then it makes it really easy to go ahead and just change whatever you want out of the right. Constitution, out of the, out of the laws and everything. Exactly. So, I mean, it's per our, na our nation is perfectly set up and equipped with um, with the whole gay marriage movement because God doesn't matter in all this, right? So it's it's so, oh, it's sad. Thank you so much for that. And truly, this is very important. You think about Animal Farm. Let's keep them from le even learning to read. And then they won't even know what the commandments are. Then we can change them and they won't even know. Yeah, please. God put all this back work into restoring the gospel and setting up this nation, yes. and Satan's putting a whole lot of work into trying to destroy that. Yes. Thank you so much. And, and friends, can I just say, uh, I am sure that all of us in this room have loved just basking in the primary sources from our founding fathers and mothers who frequently reference God and his hand. Um, but today, I, I'm, I'm very excited to dive deeper into a few of those. Gordon, please, what would you say, my friend? Kind of like with Caleb's comment, um, it's with Jehovah and Satan, like it says in the Bible. It kind of refers to Newton's law because with every action that Jesus takes, Satan's always trying to do a reaction that will keep him up with mm -hmm. Jesus. Oh, I love that. Um, and, and I think it is interesting, this idea uh, that we need to believe that there really is opposition in all things. And, and in fact, you think about um, the opposition today. Well, Elder Anderson, this was a couple years ago now, but I was listening to him speak. He was speaking to seminary teachers at the evening with the general authority. You can go and find this, this talk, because I, I'm only going to paraphrase it. I wish I could uh, just, just quote it verbatim. But essentially he said, uh, there is a tide of wickedness sweeping the earth uh, that, that, that is, is truly remarkable. But he said that God is sending, and he said, this is a paraphrase, but he said that God is sending down compensatory blessings, blessings to compensate for the great evil, that in this day there will also be a compensatory amount of blessings to flood the earth, just as Satan is trying to flood the earth with his ideas. And he mentions specifically temples flooding the earth and missionaries flooding the earth, among many other things that we could talk about. Um, and, and think of come follow me 
and all, I mean, you could go on and on and then the age change and, you know, anyway, there are compensatory blessings that are equipping us to fight the increased onslaughts that Satan is throwing against us. So we do not need to fear and think that somehow Satan's ramped up and, you know, we're left fighting him with a twig. Please, no, we are at least equal, but then certainly in the end have far more than he could ever have. Satan is not the anti-God, though he is anti-God. Because an anti-God would have just as much power that God has, but for evil. And would know everything that God does, but use it in an evil way. Satan is not all-powerful, and he's not all-knowing. And we need to know that. Certainly, we have much more on our side. Yes? Well, in class, we learned that Satan, he still respected God. He didn't... Even though he was against him, he didn't take him for granted. Or, like, when he made Abel swear not to tell anybody, he's like, and swear by the living God, he still acknowledges God, and he doesn't take him out. Thank you so much for that. I love that. Thank you. Uh, well, friends, just, just a few things here. So, uh, I, I love, whenever, whenever we think of this, I think I think of my days, uh, and I'm going to, there wasn't an earthquake in Boston. I was trying to make the picture straight <laughs> for you. Um, but uh, when, when I think about um, this topic, it really is one that I think is near and dear to all of our hearts. But, but it, it is especially near and dear to mine. And let me just tell you one reason why. Because as someone who has cared deeply um, in a very academic and scholarly way about the founding of this nation um, and who has been in the circles of those who go on to then change policy and curriculum. It's been very interesting to me because I was studying the same things they were, right? And as I was in the archives looking at the frequent references to God, uh, to Christ, to providence, to God's hand in history, kind of long story short, uh, I want you to know that I absolutely have nothing but the highest feelings of standing on sacred ground when I go back and revisit these places where I worked uh, in archives and studied and wrote papers and presented papers when I was in graduate school. Uh, this is the Old South Meeting House. You may know what started here, what great event. The Lantern. No, that, that's the Old North. This the Boston Tea Party. The meeting started here, and from here, anyway. But we can talk more about that another time. Anyway, uh, this is the old North. Oh, oh in fact, let me. okay, you can see a little bit better there. But anyway, I, I uh, love love these these churches because you can feel once again where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. There is liberty here. Therefore, the corollary is the spirit of the Lord was here, and you, you start to think about these places that have been hallowed by the third member of the Godhead. Right, and his influence, his presence, uh, in, in different ways. There's power. Uh, we have. I, I, used, I love living here because here we have the house where John Adams was born, and here we have the house where John Adams was in his adulthood. Peacefield, gorgeous, and love looking at his library, uh, and and so neat to see the family Bible, and and once again to read the sources that let you know of the great and burning testimony that he had of God. Now, also too, we never want to run the risk of saying, oh, well, therefore, they believed all the same things that we did. Because remember, just as Edwards didn't, but was a great man, they didn't have all the light knowledge that we have. They didn't live in a restoration world. right? They lived in a reformation world, and did the best they could with what they had. In fact, right, it shouldn't be a sad thing at all to know that there were some founders who didn't regularly attend the same church. Because many said, you know what, I don't know. And were very explicit saying, I don't know if there's a church on the earth that has all of the truth that I see in the Bible. But yet, in their study of the Bible, in their devotion to God, in their spirituality, in their acknowledgement of his hand in all things, we need to know uh, that they were certainly, uh, as we'll see here, and, and I think this is very important, um, what President Wilford Woodruff saw them to be, right? Uh, he described their visitation to him in the St. George Temple, uh, saying that the spirits of the signers of the Declaration of Independence gathered around me wanting to know why we did not redeem them, said they. We laid the foundation of the government you now enjoy, and we never apostatized from it, but we remained true to it and were faithful 
notice, not to a church that was on the earth at the time. We were faithful to God. And I think that's very telling. Thus, from their own lips, we know that they were faithful to God. Being faithful in this way allowed them to know that true religious principles are at the heart of both creating and maintaining a free society, and that conscience is the most sacred of all property, which is why they placed the free exercise of religion in its preeminent position as the first right protected by the Bill of Rights. And, and truly, I often wondered this. Uh, there's Wilford. Um, go to this one here. In fact, let's go to this one. Um, I, I think this is important to, to really think because we hear people talk all the time, well, you know, Thomas Jefferson talked about the wall of separation between church and state. And I feel that that phrase, separation of church and state, is the most taken out of context, misunderstood, and devilish phrase that people use these days to write out God from anything related to children learning. And I feel that this is incredibly important. I mean, you know, I have I have walked, you know, in, in the, on the on the soccer field, you know, at times um, at the high school where I teach seminary. Well, not, I don't do not at the high school, but at the seminary that's that abuts the high school. Um, but you think about this. I mean, oh, God loves you, and I have some students. Shh. Why are we? Why are we need to whisper? We're not in the seminary building. So. I, I can't say that God loves you unless I'm in a seminary building. Why not? Why not? Right? I mean, this is because people are afraid because they don't understand what this means. In fact, take a look at the way it was in the beginning. And people are so quick to say, well, let's go back to Thomas Jefferson said. Well, take a look at the world Thomas Jefferson lived in. At the state level, Massachusetts and Connecticut supported congregationalism. This was the renaming of Puritanism, okay? with tax money from their citizens. Maryland, South Carolina, and Georgia used taxes to bolster the Christian religion. Many states outlawed blasphemy as any attack on Christianity and tried to maintain religious qualifications for public office. New Hampshire, Connecticut, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Georgia required elected officials to be Protestant. South Carolina's office holders had to declare belief in one God and heaven and hell, and Delaware's public servants needed to confess devotion to the Trinity. These were written into their laws because these were the people that were making their laws. This is how religious they were. And today we might say, whoa, but now maybe this wouldn't have left room for Mormonism. And sure, maybe we are grateful that some things have changed, but let's not forget and go way far the other way either. Uh, the founders were products of and agents in the cultural milieu that produced these overtly religious state laws. So separation of church and state? The founders? Really? Perhaps we just haven't really studied history. And by taking this, among many other things, out of early American history, we may not be doing, in fact, let's just be honest, we're not doing ourselves a service. Yes? Um, I took an AP US history class uh, last year. And it's, I mean, AP, it's supposed to be the highest you can get, right. highest education, you get the best teachers, and you're reading from the best. I mean, they've taken a lot of time on the books. It's a brand new book <laughs> um, and taken years to do it. And there was almost no part on the Declaration of Independence, maybe just a teeny half chapter on founders, and zero, you know, there was no God in it whatsoever. And it just kind of flew by like it wasn't even important, that there were just a mm. bunch of <clears throat> rebels who mm -hmm. somehow, you know, won, you right. know. And so I really think it's amazing how crazy, I mean, they missed the entire, I mean, mm. and if you believe that, then, then I can see how we're in this world today where we aren't, we're not moral, and we're not, if we don't believe mm. and know how this country, how it was founded and why it was founded. Mm. So. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Love that. Please, Mrs. Updike. Yeah. <clears throat> Our contemporary... Common Core textbook. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. It's, and you must hold down. In our contemporary Common Core textbooks for 10th grade, 
one pair, one small section of the Declaration, the, the entire lesson, the entire treatment of the Declaration of Independence, which is taught in English rather than history, where the teacher has no background, is compared by a Spanish, uh, uh, Mexican writer. The, the writing of the, of the Declaration is compared with the making of tortillas. And that is the extent of their exposure to the Declaration of Independence. Thank you so much for that. Friends, I mean, I think on the one hand, you know, we could say, oh, you know, let's look at this. And, oh, almost, almost you know, um, easy to, to just sort of be very, very dismissive and say, oh, these books are all just dumb. But, guys, this is so much more, as, as I think we're all feeling here. Uh, this is this is vital to our very freedom, uh, the freedom that that God has given us, um, and it it is so incredibly saddening uh, when you see the best and brightest, right? You know all of these people that I was in this PhD program with, um, who just are asking other questions. You know, some of them, some of them have a faith of their own, but they're just saying, well, no, but I just, we, you know, that's been done already. We've moved past God. So now we need to look at the economic motives of the founders. Now we need to look at the social motives of the founders. Let's look at the founders and diversity. Let's look at, you know, the founders and gender, the founders and race. The founders and, you know, you name it, right, class and labor and all these other fields that have become more popular since sort of the, the 60s and the 70s with the new social history um, that's come. Tried to give voice to people who didn't have a voice in many ways, which in some ways is a great thing. In other ways, it has once again been taken too far. Um, and I think it's just so sad because here we have document after document showing that God was absolutely part of American life. And still is for many, many Americans. But yet we have half of the nation being written out of the textbooks that all of the nation is being forced to study if you study in a publicly sanctioned, national history standards approved classroom. And once again, not that you can't find good, not that you can't be a light, not that you can't share these good things, but it is sad to think that if people didn't know better, they might just think that the founders were a bunch of greedy, old, white, sexist, racist, heterosexist men because of all of the labels that have been placed on them today by these different textbook writers who are pushing different agendas and said, can I say, certainly, we know better than that. Yes? <laughs> the part that's so sad to me, too, is, and as I watched my son, who's had a classical education up to this point, it's just so frustrating because there is no comparing and contrasting. So mm -hmm. he goes into this classroom and it's like, how do I even go up against this? Right. How do I have this conversation? Mm -hmm with a bunch of people who, if I do, I'm now going to be labeled as this weirdo. Right. And, you know, this this person who might be fighting against, mm -hmm. you know, and there's no, there's nothing, they're not even giving them like a little nibble of, right. any, there's no golden nugget in there. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is how it is, this is how it was, and it's all bad, and, you know, it's, it's not like here's a little bit of truth and here's a little bit of faults. It just seems to be... All the truth has been stripped away, and so there's not even, unless they have parents or a mentor or someone outside, this is just what they're given. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just sad to me. Thank you for that. Caleb. It's interesting. I like what you said about being having the truth stripped away and then just whatever's left. So if we teach that, then... Honestly, it's like you said, the revolution becomes just a bunch of people who decided they wanted some selfish reason, mm -hmm. and it, it becomes pointless. Right. When countries forget God, that's when countries die. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the revolution succeeded because God wanted it to succeed. That's the whole point. And if we throw that away, then our future children are going to have a real hard time keeping this country great. Yes. 
Thank you so much for that. Mr. Anderson, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? Thank you. It just seemed like the separation of church and state comment has been taken out of context and attached way broader meanings than mm -hmm. what it was originally intended mm -hmm. to do. Because anyone that goes back to these rich source texts that you're sharing with us cannot help but come away with, with the knowledge that they believed in God. And they believed that these were his principles that they were furthering by setting up this type, type of government. And if they were praying before during their meetings and, and those type of things. Anyone that reads George Washington's letters, his personal letters, can't come away feeling that he had some big separation between God and his personal feelings and writing style. Oh, thank you so much for that. And I love that. It's so important. And, and two, once again, as we as we read about, you know, in section 134, certainly Right, there is a place for some kind of righteous separation between church and state in the world we live in. Because once again, not, not ultimately, but if church and state weren't separated and we had Catholicism as the state religion of the United States, could the restoration have happened here? Does that make sense? So certainly, once again, there are balancing principles that help us to find the truth right, that we can celebrate because of the restoration of the gospel. Caleb, and then Mrs. Rickenbach. And that's the most important thing is it helps us with our free agency. Even if if a state religion would have been Mormonism, at the time it wouldn't have been a good thing because they still need that agency. Mm -hmm. It's the same reason we don't force people to read the Book of Mormon and yes. show them the gold plates because they still have to learn for themselves and make that choice. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Please. Oh. <laughs> um, It'll come back. That's okay. If it comes back around the tracks, let us know about the trick. Okay. Uh, well, well let, let's go just for a moment here because, let, in fact, let, let, let's do this. Let's oh, go. I remember now. Oh, good. Yes, please. Um, you know, we don't want to be forced and we don't want to have to have some religion that we don't believe in, but it's so important because our constitution and everything was founded upon God's laws, on natural laws and all these different things, then if we take God out, this, it, it was built for a moral people. Mm. And so if we take out morality, then it doesn't work. And, and we see that now. We've taken out, um, well, we don't have a moral people anymore. And so our constitution does not apply to our country anymore because the people aren't moral. And so it doesn't work anymore because, you know, these people want to practice same-sex marriage and so let's just go ahead and take it out because we're not moral anymore so it doesn't work anymore for I mean I'm not saying that we should take it out right, but I'm right, just saying that that's, right. that's what's happened oh thank you for that and, and I think this really is interesting um, because as, as we think about this here uh, let's think we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions think about what you just talked about and think about Gordon's great comment, human passions, right, unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Have we just seen a whale placed in a net this summer? You know what I mean? You start to think about that. Um, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Um, and, and, I, and I think, really, we need to look no farther uh, than the example of George Washington for what John Adams was writing about. Um, and, and, I, and I do love this. Uh, in their personal devotion to God, the founders' hearts were clearly believing hearts. And Washington provides a case in point. He found truth. And, and I think this is so interesting to think of those who lived at a time when the restoration hadn't yet happened, right? And they're saying, oh, but, oh, I like this. And, well, that feels right, too. And now, now that, you know what I mean? There's no church on the earth that's the church that's in the Bible, right? Uh, and so I think this is so, so neat. Um, 
Washington found truth in all religions and attended Anglican, Congregational, Lutheran, Dutch Reformed, Roman Catholic services, among others. He was a member of his Anglican church vestry, which is a committee to oversee sort of temple affairs of the church, though he never felt comfortable committing himself wholly to one church by partaking of the Eucharist, which is the Lord's Supper or the sacrament, right? Saying that I, there's just more out there, right? I love God. I love Christ. I know these truths from the Bible and I study it. But I can't just commit to one church because I just don't feel that there's one that's here that has everything. Was he right? He was. He was. And that's the beauty of it. Um, let's just go here just for a moment. His first inaugural address expressed more religious sentiment. What a beautiful address. Read it with your children. Uh, than any in American history, other than perhaps Lincoln's second. And he was among the strongest proponents of the role of religious principles in retaining America's liberty through a virtuous and moral citizenry. During the Revolutionary War, he required all of his troops to attend religious services and had readily acknowledged the divine hand of providence in the protection of his troops and himself. He, like most of the founders, firmly believed in the existence of God and the power of prayer and in an afterlife. As president, he called the nation together in days of fasting and prayer. Though he sometimes used deistic language, like calling God the grand architect of the universe, he knew and expressed often that he was no absentee father who had wound up the world's clock and then taken a vacation. He governed and intervened directly in the affairs of his children. And Washington, like other members of the founding generation, called on him to aid the young nation. Um, so friends, let's reason for a moment from Washington's document, uh, because I think this is such a sweet thing. What, what stood out to you about principles that George Washington understood? as we read the proclamation of a national thanksgiving from the 3rd of October, 1789. What principles would you reason Washington understood from this little paragraph here, the bottom of page 73, or I'm not sure what page you have, but whatever page it is for you. Please, Caleb, what do you understand? Um, it reminds me a little bit of what we read about William Bradford, mm. and where and I think it says, um, the beneficent author of all good that was, that is, and will be. And it just reminded me of how he, Bradford, praised the Lord in everything. It didn't matter what it was. It was like, oh, thank you for this. You've blessed us here. You've blessed us there. And that he would set apart day for the whole country. Mm. I mean, if you did that now, we'd be laughed at. But... That the whole country could thank God for, for everything and really pray for our country. I thought it was amazing. So. Yes, thank you for that. And the fact that he asked the whole country to pray together, what principle of a righteous people did Washington understand there? Because I think this, this is part of a Zion society, and he understood these principles of one. Um, that you have to have unity with yourself and God, but that you also have to have unity with your community and God as well. I love that we strive to face and follow the Lord as one man, one heart, one mind, tied to him, right? And because we're tied to him, we love each other. We take care of each other. I mean, just he understood these powerful principles of unity. What else did Washington understand from this source? What would you reason? Please. Well, he knew that his country was a moral country. Mm. Otherwise, he wouldn't have asked them to do this. Right. Yeah, and I think this is so important because, once again, here we have a president asking the entire nation in an official proclamation from the president to fast, to pray, etc. And now we can't even mention that they even talked about God. You're like, wait a minute. This, how, how can you whitewash this from history? It happened. I didn't make this up. I didn't write it. This is on a scrap of paper somewhere that somebody has transcribed, and then I transcribed it for you. You know, this is evidence of what they knew and understood about the country and about themselves and about the Lord at that time. Why are we forgetting this? Why can't we at least be true to who they were and what they knew? Yes, Leah, and then Caitlin. Um, he understood that we truly need to be grateful to God and that he helped them, um, like, win the revolution and um, uh, have, like, an, have um, an actual thanksgiving to 
yeah, anyway. Um, but like there were so many things that he knew that they had to be grateful for and that God helped them um, become a nation. Thank you for that. I love that. He helped them become a nation. God did. Thank you so much for that. Caitlin, thank you for your patience. Um, just one thing when I was reading it um, and I reread it, I noticed that it says, well, that he says, um, both the houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested that he had this. And yeah. I was just like, I mean, I was just astounded that they agreed on that thing, which I feel like, I mean, at least in the what you hear on today, you can't agree on, you right. know, one is one way, the other is the other way. And I, I never get the feeling that good is coming from mm. this. But to find that they they wanted this day of prayer and worship to God was amazing to me. Mm. And really just the character of the people then to now is drastically different. Thank you so much. And I think that's so telling. But did somebody make this up today to help themselves feel better about their own faith, that all the members of the house were, you know, in on this. And I, and I think this is so important to remember. Thank you so much for that. Please. Really quick, I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> well, thank you for your comments. I, I just had this little epiphany. Um, he understood the principle of gratitude mm. and what happens when people are humble and when they're grateful. Yes. Because it's when we, when we become ungrateful that then we stop believing in God and we stop, we, we become prideful and all those things. So he understood that gratitude was so important in keeping a people a certain way, mm. the way that they understood it that. Oh, thank you so much for that. Uh, and, I, and I think it's so important too, gratitude to God, um, because it is so sad when you hear that, oh, this little third grade teacher or whatever Wait, we're having a day of gratitude, so let's write the things that you're thankful for about each other. A day of gratitude to talk about the world, but yet don't talk about the person who's responsible for everything that you're grateful for, because somehow that would violate a certain separation that seems to be quite misunderstood. You know, I love that. Thank you so much. Well, friends, okay. With that said, though, and I think this is important because as we look at Jefferson, his you might say, is a little more complex, but yet equally as important in what he understood. So would you go to Jefferson's document for a moment, and what would you reason that Jefferson understood about a balancing principle? Because, for example, right, if we had a nation in which we had a president who said, let's have a day of praying to Heavenly Father, we'd probably be really thrilled, right? But on the other hand, what if he then said, and if anybody prays to anybody other than Heavenly Father, you'll be imprisoned. And you see how so quickly we could take something good and say, wait, we're now trampling on other rights because conscience is the most sacred of all property, even if it's conscience acting in a way that we don't agree with, right? like praying to another god or another set of gods. Yes. Almost like Daniel in the den, but it's kind of flipped around. Right. So he forced them to pray to him yeah. instead of God, but he's afraid of God who was forced in. It's kind of the opposite of that, but it still has the same effect. Yeah, thank you for that. We we really do. I mean, you look at what the brethren are teaching these days, and you and you wonder, will there be another talk about this at this next conference in a couple of days? Um, about religious liberty. This idea that we have to understand that it's not the millennium yet, and we're not in Massachusetts Bay Colony anymore. So we need to understand there has to be a two-way street, but it does have to be a two-way street. It can't, be a, it can't be a one-way road for secularism or a one-way road for any one religion. It has to be a two-way give and take, right, where we respect others' ability to believe what they want to believe. And as Joseph Smith said, I would just as soon die for, and he lists all these other followers of different religions, as I would for a Mormon. Are we ready to say the same thing? That because of our willingness to protect their right to believe, we also are protecting our right to believe, too, differently. Yes? Uh, even, like, in Zion, and we haven't built Zion yet, but when we do, it won't be excluded to just those who are members of the church. Mm -hmm. It'll be anyone who's willing to abide by laws, which are the commandments of God, but you don't necessarily have to be a Mormon to do that. Anything that would force anyone to do anything, take away agency, 
is never a good thing. Right. Thank you so much for that, because certainly, as we think about the terrestrial resurrection that will happen during the millennium, that includes the honorable men and women of the earth. Not everyone is going to be of one mind, even when Christ reigns personally, which is an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so, friends, let's look at Jefferson for a moment. What did Jefferson understand? In fact, were there any lines that stood out to you about a principle that Jefferson understood that we, too, need to understand? Caleb, please. Sorry, I keep talking. But... I love the comments. Thank um, you. The one that really stuck out to me and that I think really is in play today, yeah. you see, um, is... Um, by argument to maintain their matters of religion, and that the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. So, no matter your belief, and we see this a ton with between abortion today and gay marriage, and people who have their religious reasons for believing or either not believing, um, and things that people therefore they boycott businesses or they you know they lose their job or all kind of things because they have that specific belief. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you for that. I love that insight. Thank you. Anything else that you've reasoned? Some principles that Jefferson understood that would be wise to take into ourselves. Please. Um, just that, like in the very beginning, um, he says, the Almighty God hath created the mind free, um, and that by finding, by seeing in ourselves, that that, that having a free mind um, is very important to God. Um, in my relate, I kind of made how we need to protect other people's rights mm. so that they can think and mm. reason for themselves, but also to make sure that we don't take things or do things that will bind our conscience, mm. like doing drugs or anything right. else that will kind of take that conscious or the freedom of our mind away from us and how we need to treasure that more than we do. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Friends, when have you felt, as, as we keep relating this, I think this is really important, when have you felt that you were either, A, grateful that you had the free exercise of religion and the free practice of religion, which is part of that, as part of this nation's great and hopefully still protected rights, um, or when have you really felt that that right was trampled upon by someone? Curious to see if you ever felt sort of either of those where you really had a moment where you realized, wow, I am free here to say this or to do this, and I am so grateful. Or that was just trampled and that was wrong because I should have been able to do that or I shouldn't have been forced to do that. When has that been for you? What would you relate Brenna. Okay, so this last summer I read a book yeah. um, about a Muslim who was converted to Mormonism. Yes. And he went to jail for about 15 years before he was able, before he was at least able to come to the U.S. And I found it interesting because I would be reading this book and then I would stop, you know, come back upstairs with my right, with my life for a while, and I think, wow, I can practically do anything I want. I'm so lucky. It was just a really incredible experience. Thank you so much. For, I love that contrast right, that you were able to see between his life behind bars for his beliefs and yours coming up and down as you please to read his book as you wanted. Love that. Please. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the religious side of it, but we own a business, mm -hmm. and so I feel grateful that yeah. I can be a business owner. Right. That I can choose something that I want to yes. do and then go out and do it. Yes. But I'm appalled at the amount of taxes that we have to pay. Right, right. You know, back in these early, so many, mm -hmm. so many of the things that they thought about were how much do we actually mm -hmm. give the government? I think it was like 
40%? Depending on the year, the time, and the state, and the... Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, now it's like 35% yeah. plus, but I can do nothing about that. Right. I can't just decide, well, I, this is how much I want to pay for taxes. Right. And so, you know, but it's just that feeling of unjust, mm. you know, overextended, mm. and I don't know. Encroachment, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Please. Jefferson even mentioned that. He said yes. that to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. I love that. Please. And would you say that one more time in the microphone? Because I think our friends uh, from afar will benefit greatly from hearing that. And if you just either hold it or, or just slide is it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I, I just It just stuck out to me when I read this. He said... Um, that to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. Our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions any more than our opinions in physics or geometry. Right. <laughs> it enacted by the General Assembly, the no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever, nor shall be enforced, restrained, molested, or burdened in his body or goods. And if he goes on and on, yeah. he just says, you this is wrong. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Oh, love, love that insight. Thank you. Please, Gordon. Yesterday for Family on the Evening, we were talking about David Crockett and how he would vote for laws yeah. in the Senate. And um, uh, one year he had voted for a lot to raise like $25,000 to pay for some people who had lost their homes in Georgetown from the fire and Congress could have easily given them that much money but they passed the bill and it's a really long story but um, in the end he doesn't vote for those laws anymore because a farmer tells him that if they pay their money, it shouldn't be for charity because it, you should be able to pay out of your own heart for charity. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I love that example. Thank you, Gordon. Please, Caleb. That's um, kind of another thing that we see a lot of today is the government reaching out and saying, oh, we'll take care of this for you, or, you know, we, we got it covered. Or of things that should be people's generosity mm -hmm. should take care of. We shouldn't have to have welfare programs for people. We just shouldn't. That should be everyone taking care of each other. And back in those days, and like you said, with that, with those laws, you realize that's not something that we should be taking care of. That's the people. So just another kind of thing that they do today that probably shouldn't be done. Thank you so much. Wouldn't the world be a different place if we all had the privilege of becoming more like God by caring for our neighbors and growing in compassion because we knew their needs and helped them? And then they did the same for us. Love that. Thank you so much. Well, friends, these principles are very rich and very important. I um, just want to close with this little story. Um, it was very interesting to me. And, and some may have heard this, but I think most of the room actually haven't. Um, it was very interesting to me when I when I lived in Massachusetts, uh, and, and I was teaching um, fifth grade there. Uh, and when I was teaching fifth grade there, this school, uh, and, and there are a lot of stories from this experience, but one that I want to talk about today is the school wanted to change its diversity curriculum. And when it wanted to change the curriculum, it gave me... Uh, a sort of question and answer about the topic of acting on feelings of same gender attraction. Okay, um, and, I, and, I, and I read this with great interest. I was very curious to see what it would say. Um, and because the school said, this is what you need to do because we're going to have a day. And it was called Homophobia Awareness Day. That was the, the day at the school. Um, and sort of on the one hand, it was a day about if people are different from you, don't slash their tires, burn their houses, you know, and, and be mean to them. Certainly, don't we believe that, right? We believe that. We should be Christ-like to everyone, right? Especially sinners. Right? I mean, so, okay. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, that the day became much more 
uh, than that. And it was a day where I was supposed to meet with my fifth graders, you know, nine and ten. And I was supposed to go through this packet of information with them. And the topic of the packet of information was, what should students think about religions that condemn acting on feelings of same gender attraction as sinful? What should they think about this? And I was thinking, what do you mean, what should they think about this? Where, where are you going with this, right? Well, as I read, it was very, very disheartening, even as it was incredibly interesting um, in just sort of the satanic logic behind it. Because that curriculum said, you will probably have students in your class who come from traditional conservative religions who still believe and teach that same gender attraction and the acting on it, right? Just, you know, that, or let me be more specific, uh, that two men marrying two men or two men, two women marrying two women, that that is sinful behavior and not accepted by their church. Be sure to tell them in a sensitive way that they need to help educate their parents about what is right and wrong and that their parents are clinging to bigoted and antiquated notions that at one time were used to justify prejudice and hate. And that you as the teacher need to make sure that your students know that even if their parents hold these beliefs, you can train them on this day to be activists against conservative religions, even like the ones their parents might hold. And then there was a little note at the bottom of the page, because of course, I, I, you know, if, I, if I wasn't riled up enough after reading that, the note at the bottom of the page was, be sure to understand too, that if you as a teacher are still clinging to conservative traditional notions about these matters, that there is no place in an educational setting for heterosexism that heterosexism, basically the saying that heterosexual relations are right and homosexual relations are wrong, that's their definition of heterosexism, uh, that if that is what you're teaching, that you need to understand that your beliefs are bigoted and hateful and oppressive, and you too need, as part of this diversity curriculum, to undergo a thought reformation process. Manipulative. Holy cow. That was the document. And I remember reading that, and obviously hundreds of different red flags went off, but I could not believe that we had come to that kind of a juncture in our history. Garrett. Well, um, that's such a socialistic view. I, it's the government telling people what's right and wrong. And, um, Please say that again. It's a socialistic view that the government tells you what's right, what's wrong. You believe this, you believe that, and if you disagree with us, you're gone. You're, you don't think what you want to think. Government tells you what to think. Government controls everything. And so like, just doing that, it takes away a lot of what the founders wanted. A whole lot. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. <laughs> no, anyway, well, friends, please get, go ahead. I know our time is short. I apologize. Sorry, just to add on that real quick, it completely takes away our right of conscience. Mm. And, I mean, what's the point if we don't? Or at least tramples that? upon it because you can't take away something that God gives, yeah. right? Government doesn't give it. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if they do that, and if you don't comply with that, they will mm. defame you and defraud mm. you until you basically either have no choice or you just have to go away. Did they say you were fired if you... So there's actually quite a long story to it, longer than I can tell in yeah. the, the, the 20 seconds to wrap up. Um, but I think it might come back again. You'll, well, I, actually, I know it will. In, in, fact, in fact, in our eighth topic for this very unit, it will. So wait a few topics. Right. You'll hear much more. Um, but I do want to say this, friends. Um, one thing that I, that I want, and I want to make sure, because these things are happening today, as you know, as, as we all know. Um, but just because they're happening, it doesn't mean that God's commandment for us to have faith instead of fear, to look unto Christ in every thought, doubt not, fear not. It doesn't mean that that has somehow been revoked or that we can't still practice that anymore. 
there is great wickedness in our world. There is great wickedness in our nation. But I testify that God's power to give us hope and healing, at least as individuals as we come unto him, is far greater than any evil design the world could throw at us. And I testify of that from personal experience um, because as I went each day for eight months that year after choosing to stand up and fight this document among others, I just want to testify that I don't know if I have ever felt the power of the Lord in my life in as strong and as constant away. That as I would get up in the morning and I would pray for the strength to face colleagues who would ignore me and get up when I sat down at faculty meetings and vacate the lunch table and send me hate mail in my email and in my mailbox at school and do a lot of other things that we could talk about another time. Um, I just testify that it was at those moments that God was absolutely there for me in a way in which, to me, he became even more real than I had ever known before. And so I testify that with the challenges of the day come some of the most sacred privileges that could not perhaps be had and experienced in any other way. I testify that for those who choose to stand with the Savior in the last days, that you will have opportunities to come to know him in ways that are more personal and sacred than you can share. And I just testify that he lives, and I testify that he can enable us to stand as his witnesses in these latter days, regardless of how far off the founder's path this country becomes. And I share that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can I just ask real quick, what year was that? That was 2009. Garrett, would you offer our closing prayer, please? Dear Holy Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for the opportunity that we had to come here and to the Holy Spirit to learn about these great things and please help us to apply the things that we've learned to our daily lives and help us to be able to stand up for what is right, for what is true, and see these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kara. Uh, let me let me say too that year ended in 2009. It was the 2008-2009 academic year, okay. so the one that began in August and ended in June. Thank you so much, friends. Yeah, it seems like a long time ago. I didn't realize the intensity and the heat was quite there at that point yeah. for that topic. Yeah. Was that around the same time as Proposition 8? It, it, it was. It, it, was. it, it, it followed on the heels. So, we'll, we'll yeah. And there's a, there's there. It is quite a long, well, quite a long just story. Well, just shelter here in Utah. Yeah, and you don't of realize, course. Like, you know, and and what keep in mind, Massachusetts there. was the state, the first state to legalize same-sex marriage, which is one of the reasons why it was far, far ahead. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for your comments and class. Thank you. Yes. Gordon, thank you so much, my friend. I love your comments. Every time you make them, thank you.